So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being um, here with us. Um, together with our colleagues from the German Marshall Fund, uh, Bucharest office, as well as my team at the Aspen Institute in Romania, um, we're very happy to have a very timely conversation um, at times of change, at strategic, but also almost philosophical, fundamental change of how um, relationships between countries within countries, uh, within major forces shaping societies in the region of the Black Sea um, and Eurasia in general, uh, unfold as we speak. In that context, I think, sits both this conversation and the media project that you, you'll see um, in a few minutes. Um, we don't see this conversation as a separate, as a single event. We see it rather part of a series of conversation that both the German Marshall Fund, the Aspen Institute, and many other institutions, either uh, uh, in partnership or individually, are doing across the region. It's an effort, it's part of a continuous effort, not only to understand, but also shape debates, influence maybe decision making, and ultimately strategic thinking about the fundamentals of what's unfolding in the region, not just um, what's going on in eastern Ukraine, um, the events in Crimea, but also the, the, the background um, upon which this unfolds, the societal changes, the fundamental perspectives, whether for businesses, governments, political forces, uh, citizens in this region. And I think uh, this conversation uh, puts together all these elements. Uh, we will talk about identity, we will talk about vicinity, we will talk about geography, we will talk about security, but ultimately all these come together in a very, um, um, it, it both in a very structured way when we approach it academically, but also in a very emotional way when you talk about um, the, the, the average Joe, so to speak, the, the, the citizens of the countries in, those, in this region with their fears, their apprehensions, their expectations, their desires, and ultimately, um, um, if, we, if we really look up to what our institutions uh, are, are supposed to be doing, uh, this is the, the type of conversation that I think ties into our fundamental raison d'etre. The, the, a contribution, as we call it at the Aspen Institute, for, for a good society, when it comes to, to the German Marshall Fund, for a fundamental transatlantic link based uh, on, on the same shared um, values of democracy, freedom, etc. So with that, it is my pleasure to invite um, Alina Inae, Director of the uh, GMF Bucharest Office and Coordinator of the um, Black Sea Trust, to introduce the speakers and the media project that we're going to see uh, in a few minutes. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, Andre. I will be very brief because uh, what I would really like to, to, to give ample time to is watching the movie and then, um, and then having the conversation, having the discussion. The idea of the, of the movie is not ours. It's Ovidius. Ovidius Nahoy, who's sitting here in the front row and he's going to be one of the speakers, is the one who really came up with the idea and produced and, 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 and shoot the film. Um, the movie. Um, so we are thinking for the sake of this meeting, for the sake of this event, to, uh, to take, first of all, to take some time to watch the movie, to watch the documentary, to see what is going on in Bujak these days. It's very fresh. Uh, you shoot it last month in December. Um, so all the information is very, very fresh. Uh, so the idea was to watch the movie and then we'll be, we'll be going into a conversation and in order to have different angles um, on, the, on the subject, we invited uh, Hannah Schellest from Odessa to be one of the speakers, also sitting in the front row. Cornel Chura from Moldova, um, uh, also sitting in the front row. Um, Ovidio, of course, and Dimitar, uh, Dimitar Bechev from, uh, from Bulgaria to really have all the possible angles. There is one missing, but uh, I'm sure it's, uh, it's going to come into the conversation, um, into, into, into the region and into the implications of what's going on in the region. So, Without, uh, without further ado, let's go into watching the documentary and then we'll go into, into the discussion. Uh, 
La fel la Brăila, pe malul Dunării, suntem la marginea a ceea ce se numește deja spațiul geopolitic al Occidentului. Vă invit la o călătorie în partea cealaltă, în celălalt spațiu geopolitic. Iată, suntem în prima zi de iarnă. Primăvara rusă însă, după aceste luni de iarnă, se anunță extrem de fierbinte. Și de aceea vrem să vedem realitățile din zona Bugeacului și din regiunea Odesei. Veniți cu noi! Lăsăm în urmă România la punctul de frontieră Galați-Giurgiulești. Mergem spre nordul Mării Negre, care a devenit o zonă extrem de sensibilă după deteriorarea situației politice din estul Europei, iar accesul la gurile Dunării îi dă o mare importanță în acest context. După câteva ore petrecute la cele două frontiere, română moldovenească și moldo ucraineană plonjăm imediat nu doar într-o altă realitate geopolitică, ci parcă și într-un alt timp. Printre vechi modele de Lada și mașini de teren contemporane, în peisajul urban amintind de România începutului anilor 90, o ciudată geografie mentală ne face să ne simțim departe, deși ne aflăm la doi pași de granița cu România. Aceasta este Basarabia istorică, sau Bugeacul, după denumirea turco-totară. Posesiunea domnitorilor Basarabi, începând cu secolul al XIV-lea, apoi a domnitorilor moldoveni și în cele din urma a turcilor, la finele anilor 1400. După 1812, când aici vine Imperiul Rus, denumirea de Basarabia s-a extins asupra întregii regiuni dintre Prut și Nistru și nu doar a acestui colț dintre Dunăre, Mare și Nistru. În 1918, întreaga provincie a Basarabiei revine la România, dar numai până în 1940, când Basarabia este reanexată de URSS ca o consecință a pactului Ribbentrop-Molotov. Stalin a decupat provincia și a trecut sudul Basarabiei în componența Ucrainei. Astăzi regiunea face parte din Ucraina și are centrul administrativ la Odessa. Va fi aici teatrul viitoarei agresiuni rusești? pentru a asigura Kremlinului acces la gurile Dunării? Se va orienta regiunea spre Europa? Dar câtă Europa se găsește de fapt aici? Încercăm să aflăm răspunsuri. În viziunea mea, deci, importanța acestei zone pentru România și pentru noi românii de aici este că e o zonă populată în bună parte de, de, de români. Lumea aceea care ești de acolo, în mare majoritate, îi continuă să-și spună moldoveni. Și în politica promovată de Ucraina, deci vis-a-vis de dânsii, se mizează pe anume pe accentul ăsta, pe subiectul ăsta, că ei spun moldoveni. Și dacă sunt moldoveni, înseamnă că ei vorbesc limba moldovenească, înseamnă că au cultura lor moldovenească și deci patria lor istorică e Moldova, Republica Moldova, nu România. Ei spun, dacă nu românii, românii vin să ne românizeze, vin să românizeze moldovenii. Mm-hmm. Asta e argumentul lor. Suntem la Ismail. Oraș care a dat României doi prim-ministri și în același timp comandanți militari, pe mareșalul Alexandru Averescu, născut într-un stat din apropiere numit în epocă Babele, și pe Artur Văitoianu, general român, comandant în timpul primului război mondial și prim-ministru pentru trei luni de zile la sfârșitul lui 1919. Tot de aici provin și marele cronicar sportiv Ioan Chirilă sau muzicologul Gavril Muzicescu, dar și numeroase personalități ale culturii ucrainene, bulgare, ruse, evreiești sau germane. În istorie, Ismail era un veritabil creozet cultural. Orașul Ismail este un rezultat direct al războaielor ruso-turce. În 1790, cetatea otomană Ismail cade în mâna armatelor ruse, comandate de generalul Suvorov, cel care avea să-și găsească sfârșitul în podgoriile românești de pe Valea Siretului. A fost o luptă crâncenă. Turcii au respins ultimatumul rusesc și s-au bătut cu disperare. A urmat o baie de sânge. Se spune că peste 25.000 de turci, după alte surse chiar 40.000, de la copii din leagă și până la bătrâni, ar fi fost masacrați de trupele disperate ale generalului Suvorov. Măcelul a ținut trei zile și trei nopți. Suvorov veghează astăzi călare pe cal în parcul central din Ismail. În spatele său se află catedrala ridicată în amintirea victoriei 
care a adus Rusia la gurile Dunării. Istoria o scriu învingătorii. Moschea din Ismail este azi muzeu orășenesc. Dar diversitatea culturală a rezistat timpului. După primul război mondial, mai bine de un sfert din cei circa 35.000 de locuitori erau evrei. Cam tot atâția români, restul germani, ruși, lipoveni, ucraineni, dar existau familii de unguri, de greci sau de albanezi. În 2001, din cei peste 70.000 de locuitori, aproape 40% se declarau ucraineni, 30% ruși, 13% lipoveni și 7% bulgari. De români nu se mai știa mai nimic, doar 4% se declarau moldoveni. Astăzi, să te declari român în această regiune nu e chiar un delict, dar mai bine ar fi să te reorientezi. Varianta moldovenească e cu mult mai comodă. La începutul anilor 90, în regiune funcționau 20 de școli în limba română, oficial moldovenească. Au rămas doar 5. În restul sunt introduse clase ucrainene, s-au rusificate complet și este, din acest punct de vedere, nu avem mari, mari perspective. Deci a fost o greșeală foarte mare a autorităților și nu numai a celor pro-europene sau celor care au fost pro-ruse. Să sperăm că această deschidere spre democrație va fi benefică pentru comunitatea noastră românească. Am nimerit cum nu se poate mai bine la Ismail. Am ajuns chiar în ziua în care se marca sărbătoarea națională a României, după șapte ani de absență. În această seară în care am ajuns la Ismail, peste 100 de români au înfruntat minsoarea și prejudecății și au venit la teatrul din oraș. Alămurile formației Tarnis din Chișinău îi ridică de pe scaune. Spectacolul este oferit de Institutul Cultural Român, prin intermediul Consulatului Român de la Odessa. Este până la urmă o îngemânare fericită între România și Republica Moldova, cea pe care oamenii de aici o consideră de fapt ca pe adevărata lor țară mamă. Viitorul regiunii este însă nesigur. Presa din Republica Moldova vorbea recent despre posibilitatea instaurării unei Republici a Bugeacului, după modelul Donbass care ar urma să cuprindă și regiunile din sudul Republicii Moldova, acolo unde opiniile majoritare sunt anti-europene. Ideea nu e chiar nouă. A mai fost vânturată în ultimul deceniu, de exemplu de către unii lideri din Găgăuzia, o regiune a Republicii Moldova unde trăiește populație de origine turcă, numărând câteva zeci de mii de suflete. Va face Rusia următorul pas în această regiune și va veni până la granița cu România? Nu cred că un scenariu similar, identic, ar fi posibil în sudul Basarabiei, din cauza că nu e aceeași situație din punct de vedere al ponderii unei națiuni dominante, să zicem. În Crimea, majoritatea sunt rusofoni, pe când aici, în sudul Basarabiei, nici măcar națiunea titulară a statului ucrainean, ucrainienii, nu sunt majoritari. Avem comunități, comunitatea ucraineană, comunitatea de ruși lipoveni, avem comunitatea românească, bineînțeles, avem comunitatea de bulgari, găgăuzi, albanezi, un conglomerat foarte, foarte, foarte amestecat de naționalități și nu, nu cred că e posibil să fie primită cu aceeași evlavie sau să aibă aceleași rezultate un eventual referendum ca cel care a fost în Crimea. Diversitatea etnică pare să fie așadar deosebirea fundamentală a bugeacului față de Crimea și unul dintre principalele argumente pentru care scenariul din primăvara anului 2014 nu s-ar putea repeta aici. Și totuși, aici a fost cândva limita expansiunii ruse, teatrul ultim al războaielor ruso-turce și ultima frontieră a Novorosiei, conceptul vânturat din nou de strategii Kremlinului. Mergem să vedem monumentul războaielor ruso-turce, ridicat chiar pe malul brațului Chilia, la doi pași de frontiera românească. Puțini ajung aici, mai ales în acest sezon, 
în care îți trebuie o mașină de teren ca să răzbați pe drumurile impracticabile. Fața monumentului e îndreptată către România. O sugestie e că monumentul poate să fie văzut ca o simplă bornă și înaintarea trupelor rusești victorioase ar putea continua. De altfel, România începe la câțiva metri, dincolo de gardul de sârmă ghimpată și de cursul brațului Chilia. Veniți dintr-o Europa fără frontiere, sârma ghimpată ne redă senzația de întoarcere în timp și de îndepărtare în spațiu. Semnalul de la telefonul mobil trece însă dincolo de sârma ghimpată. Profităm ca să sunăm acasă. Suntem totuși în secolul 21. Ajungem la cetatea albă după o călătorie extenuantă. Și asta nu din cauza distanței, ci a stării foarte proaste a drumului, cotat totuși pe hartă ca drum european. Nu căutați cetatea albă pe hărțile contemporane. Veți găsi micul oraș sub denumirea de Bilhorod Nistroschi. Vechimea cetății nu e cunoscută cu exactitate, dar se știe că aici se suprapun numeroase straturi de civilizații, de la cea greacă și romană până la cea bizantină și otomană. Domnitorii țărilor române au stăpânit și ei cetatea, iar moldovenii și valahii s-au luptat din greu chiar și între ei pentru supremație. Până la urmă, Domnitorii moldoveni Alexandru cel Bun și Ștefan cel Mare au rămas în istorie pentru extinderile și întăririle pe care le-au adus cetății. Azi cetatea e bine întreținută și autoritățile locale încearcă să o exploateze turistic. Vizitatorii străini sunt însă puțini, din cauza izolării și a șoselelor în stare foarte proastă. Și mai este evident situația geopolitică, la care autoritățile locale se raportează însă cu foarte, foarte multă prudență. Nu zgâlea de nașa jutile gorda o politică situație, ea uveren, că ca cădin, este proti vâinei. Vâinei nu trebuie să fie ni în cum случае. Mir și tolcă mir. Nu, mă nu mă știu de altă lume, mai mult, ca să mai 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 Dujem nu tolka s Armonie Bratska Republika i s Moldavia riadoškom s nami. Pătemu mă uverene, că etava povtărită u nas nu dăși nu. Nu, конечно, este. Situația în Ucraina nu e prostă. Nu, ca să dă la naselenie, sigur, au fost sluci răzni, dar văzprinate atnășenie neposredțină cu miru, Это самое главное, то, что люди хотят. Но на сегодняшний день в большей степени местные жители хотят, естественно, государственного суверенитета Украины. Его хотят видеть как отдельное настоящее государство и всех остальных в Европе видеть как своих друзей и партнеров в первую очередь, потому что Украина – это самодостаточное, настоящее, нормальное государство, которое достойно быть самим собой. Părăsim cetatea albă și ne îndreptăm spre Odessa. Odată ajuns aici, impresia este că am revenit în Europa. În pofida patinei, Odessa este totuși un oraș nou după standardele europene. La sfârșitul secolului al XVIII-lea, când regiunea a fost cucerită de oștile împărătesei Caterina cea Mare, pe aici nu se găseau decât câteva sate și forturi otomane. Regiunea a fost inclusă în provincia Novorosia, un concept care aprinde și azi imaginația Rusiei lui Putin. Odessa e o zonă oarecum specifică în Ucraina, fiindcă ea face parte din statul ucrainean, dar aici tot timpul a fost la puterea rusofonii și chiar a fost adominată, adică aspirația este ruso, spre Rusia, că a fost întemeiată de ruși, orașul a fost întemeiat de către de Caterina a doua, deci de, de ruși, deci rușii au construit-o, tot ce vedem noi, centrul istoric al orașului făcut de ruși, după 1794, când ei îl întemeiază. Și deci aici și conflictul la noi care e, anume și ăsta, că deci, sunt dispoziții astea prorusești ale majorității populației și în același timp Odessa e Ucraina, deci. Ucrainenii de că își impun aici, adică limba ucraineană, tradițiile ucrainene, chestii de astea, Parad Vâșvanu, cum vă spuneam, adică lucruri care nu au fost proprii. În lumea de aici e o lume 
pragmatică, adică ei preocupate mai puțin de chestii de astea ideologizate, de tot felul de legat de spiritul ăsta național, de lumea, e, e pragmatică, ei tot se ocupă cu fac bani, adică și unii fac mai reușit, alții mai puțin reușit, dar mentalitatea lor e asta, deci ei sunt departe de lucrurile astea care ei, atât îi preocupă, de exemplu, în vestul Ucrainei, acolo, acolo îi, îi trăiesc cu asta, cu sau sunt pro sau sunt contra, deci și manifestă, e rup într-un fel dintre și toate viziunea lor și poziția lor. Când ai noștri, ei sunt așa mai rar. Și vă spun, la noi nu e amploarea aceea care e înaltă, de exemplu, în Lvov, în Ivanul Francosc, în Ternopol, chiar în Kiev, în toate situații cu de vedere, ce a fost până acum. A fost mult mai domnul, mai... cu excepția cazului din luna mai, care zic, s-a soldat cu... Declarat Porto Franco, Odessa a atras o lume pestriță din Imperiul Țarist și chiar din afara granițelor. A rămas în legendă districtul Moldovanca, unde contrabandiștii aduceau marfa din portul liber prin tuneluri săpate în stânca de calcar pe care s-a ridicat orașul. Numele Moldovanca ne spune multe despre cine făcea legea aici, în orașul pe care Ostap Bender, fascinantul bandit din cărțile lui Ilf și Petrov, îl socotea drept tărâmul tuturor posibilităților. Aici a venit multe lume, multe lume țărani fugare, lume criminală, care au, aveau probleme cu legea în alte regiuni ale Imperiului Rus. Veneau aici, aici, nimeni nu întreba ce ai făcut, tu, cine ești, de unde... Porto Franco. Porto Franco, da, și aici foarte repede se făceau averi, adică un birjan, adică câștiga într-o zi cât altă, câștiga într-o lună, adică când era dezvoltarea asta tumultoasă a orașului, erau investiții, aduceau bani. Tunelurile săpate de contrabandiști au servit rezistenței din timpul celui de-al doilea război mondial, iar mitul a fost întreținut până în zilele noastre. Azi, agențiile locale de turism oferă tururi ale catacombelor cu povești din al doilea război mondial, dar și tururi intitulate Criminal Odessa. Renumele trist de odinioară aduce bani buni orașului de azi, o ilustrare a pragmatismului Odesei de azi și din totdeauna. Orașul în care a locuit marele poet rus Alexandru Pușkin și unde, se pare, Mihai Eminescu a văzut pentru prima dată Marea, abundă de baroc și de art nouveau. Odessa pare o prelungire către răsărit a Europei, dar în același timp și o mărturie a tentativelor monarhilor ruși de modernizare forțată, de sus în jos, prin ucaz. În țările române de la începutul secolului al XIX-lea, limba franceză și obiceiurile europene aduse de ofițerii ocupației ruse, au prins imediat, atât la clasele avute cât și la cele mijlocii, la boernașii de țară din piesele lui Alexandri sau la Târgoveți. În Rusia însă, Europa a rămas la nivelul câtorva elite, risipite la Revoluția Bolșevică. Dacă există excepții, atunci Odessa e una dintre ele. În pofida progresului vizibil al limbii și culturii ucrainene, Odessa rămâne de extracție rusă, dar Odessa a respins o anexare rusească după bondelul Crimeei în primăvara lui 2014. Și încă, într-un mod cât se poate de brutal, circa 40 de activiști proruși au fost arși de vii în sediul Camerei de Comerț, acolo unde se baricadaseră după ciocniri de stradă cu susținătorii puterii de la Kiev. Episodul violent pare a fi o amprentă a naționalismului extremist ucrainean prezent, iată, și în Odessa. Eu lucrez în Odessa din 87. Țin minte anii ceia, până la 90, după 90, chiar până la 2000 și mai încoace. Deci aici, deci specific ăsta național ucrainean nu s-a manifestat așa pregnant niciodată. Nu l-am văzut. Pe urmă, după aia, treptat a început să, adică, să, să vină aici studenți, la studii studenți din regiunile cele al Lvov, Ternopol, Ivanul Francovsk aici, deci altă lume, deci special adus aici, cu viziunea asta lor pro-ucraineană, național ucraineană, chestia de asta, chiar extremistă un pic. Și pe urmă, treptat am ajuns ca aici sunt și organizații astea naționaliste radicale, deci cum ar fi Pravi Sector, și organizații au, aici au da cu formațiunile lor, deci Svoboda, organizații naționaliste radicale are și aici, ai lor, băieții sunt și mai sunt alte care înainte n-au fost. Deci chestia asta ce țin de aspectul ăsta naționalist, radical chiar, au fost ca și cum impuse mediul ăsta rusofon de aici. Episodul din primăvara anului 2014, anexarea Crimeii și, în general, amenințarea rusă, 
au generat o reacție de sens opus în Ucraina. Evenimentele care s-au succedat de la Revoluția Maidanului de la Kiev au dus la formarea unui spirit național, care cu greu putea fi observat mai înainte. Și nici chiar pragmatica Odessa nu face excepție. Before 2014, uh, many experts and even intelligence services of Ukraine were showing that or trying to persuade a lot of people that Romania is the main uh, possible way of aggression and to take themselves to Bessarabia. It was quite a cultivated and we can say that uh, some of these were definitely myths created to make some feelings uh, in the region, but some was with the clear background, for example, with the decisions to issue passports for the ethnic Romanians. Uh, and in Ukraine, the double citizenship is prohibited, so definitely it was perceived in a ne negative way here. So definitely it's created some uh, feelings that um, maybe not the annexation, but some territorial claims to Ukraine can come from the Romanian side. Crimea changed everything dramatically ever since. It became a wonderful example to look at uh, what can be the real threats. Here in Odessa, in March, we really are afraid that the same can happen with us. Later on, uh, let's say starting from August, uh, the fears of the Crimean scenario in the pure variant of it definitely decreased. First of all, because there are no physical possibilities for Russia to do the same as in Crimea or in um, Donetsk, because no border. As in Donetsk, yep, so you can't supply. What you have in Transnistria is definitely not sufficient. The second, because we performed better here for defense. And the third, because we don't have any military bases like the Russian Black Sea Fleet in Crimea. So we uh, didn't have uh, anything from inside to start the uh, process. In fața Ucrainei se ridică însă provocări uriașe. Mai înainte de toate este situația economică. Am văzut sărăcia și lipsa de perspectivă din zona Bugeacului. Odessa pare să ofere o altă imagine și totuși, de la Revoluția Maidanului încoace, cursul monedei naționale, grivna, aproape că s-a dublat în raport cu moneda euro, de la 12 grivne pentru un euro în toamna lui 2013 la 20 de grivne la sfârșitul lui 2014. Iar Ucraina are nevoie profundă de reformă internă pentru a putea cu adevărat so I'll put this for Europe. We have in the Ukrainian for uh, 23 years for independence, more than independence, we built, we built strong centralization country, strong centralization public administration. And now the main problems is decentralization, decentralization. And The most complicated thing is taxes with money, financial. 70% of whole state money should, should receive to regions, 70%. Only 30% should be in the center, in the center for ministry, for presidents, administration for Supreme Council and many other central offices. It's first, and it is the hard questions. It's the hard questions before this question connected with corruption, corruption. Am regăsit România și în biroul directorului Institutului de Administrație Publică din Odessa. Instituția desfășoară un program de colaborare academică împreună cu Universitatea Alexandru Ioan Cuza din Iași. Va ajuta asta viitorilor funcționari publici ai Ucrainei? Ne întrebăm care este cu adevărat imaginea României aici, având în vedere episodul dureros din toamna anului 1941. Atunci, zeci de mii de evrei au fost masacrați de trupele române, ca represalii pentru un act de sabotaj soldat cu aruncarea în aer a comandamentului militar. Poate că la această acțiune de sabotaj au servit și coridoarele secrete, să poate cândva de contrabandiștii din Moldovanca. Mai răditele jeli vă vremina Anis Padadesa, ne jeli pod rumânscă ocupație, căci ani băli dietmi, ani că câte mai mai dăjo uspela, i-a tăiat uspela să ducă în rumânscă școală, bol e tăcui element. Я, например, как историк, я исследую вот этот, как раз этот период обороны Одессы или как там в 
румынской интерпретации, Бадалия де Лаудеса. Прежде всего, здесь тоже существует очень много моментов, которые, скажем так, ну, скажем, мифологизированы. Почему? Да, безусловно, румынская армия по качеству своему, скажем так, уступала немецкой, и это признается и современными румынскими историками. Именно во многом это и этим и вызвано то, что, скажем так, Одессу все-таки не взяли в столь короткий период. Да, безусловно, оборона была, Одесса была очень скажем так, действительно был реальный подвиг со стороны защитников Одессы, потому что численно превосходили румынские войска. У меня очень много мифов. Много мифов, связанных с тем, что, во-первых, очень часто даже не говорится о том, что Одессу там захватывала реально четвертая румынская армия, да? какие-то абстрактные фашисты. Какие-то абстрактные фашисты, иногда даже вот есть там советские фильмы, посвященные обороне Одессы, где Почему-то присутствуют там немцы, например, какие-то немецкие танки там и про прочее, прочее, прочее. Но это было во времена социалистической Румынии, старались не говорить о том, что Румыния воевала против Советского Союза. Сегодня у нас есть возможность, ну и Румыния сама не любила писать об этом периоде. Сегодня у нас есть возможность для меня, например, как для историка, ознакомиться с румынскими источниками, с румынскими документами, с румынской литературой, посвященной этому моменту, сравнить с тем, что происходило, то есть с нашими источниками. Я считаю, что все-таки необходимо посмотреть. Подвиг был как бы, был и подвиг, и трусость, и подлость, это было все со всех, с обеих сторон. Здесь необходимо, война это слишком жесткий такой, это очень сложное явление, которое, ну, Нельзя делать, давать однозначные оценки. Просто историки должны разобраться в этом периоде. Безусловно, там нас, как у, мы без особой симпатии, наверное, относились к тому, когда в Румынии начали поднимать культ генерала и маршала Антонеску. Да, почему? Потому что для нас все-таки это как бы во многом являлся все-таки символом агрессии. И надо понимать, что на протяжении там, последних десятилетий было четкое понимание того, что на Советский Союз, частью которого была и Одесская область, напали. Да, и Румыния была часть союзником нацистской Германии. Например, сложно говорить о том, что, например, после 1944 -го года Румыния была союзником антифашистского блока. Да. И есть парадоксы, когда генерал, который здесь командовал третьим корпусом и получил орден Михаил Витязул, в 1945 году получил от советского командования орден Суворова. Не можем поразить Одесса, fără o ultimă oprire la treptele Potemkin. Locul a devenit faimos în urma scenei groazei colective din filmul Crucișătorul Potemkin a lui Sergei Eisenstein. Un film de propagandă, desigur, turnat în Rusia sovietică din anii 20, dar atât de bine realizat încât se află în programa multor academii de cinema din întreaga lume. În timpul mișcărilor revoluționare din 1905, marinarii de pe Crucișătorul Potemkin numit după unul dintre nobili de încredere a împărătesei Caterina cea Mare, s-au răsculat împotriva terorii ofițerilor. După multe aventuri, vaporul cu marinarii răsculați a ajuns în portul românesc Constanța. Marinarii au fost debarcați, li s-a asigurat libertatea de către statul român, iar vasul a fost înapoiat statului rus. Treptele Potemkin reprezintă locul mitic al Odesei, așa cum Parisul are turnul fel sau Roma, Fontana di Trevi. A fost și a rămas un mare centru, menționa mea, în primul rând, cultural, care aparține, dacă e în Ucraina, dar aparține nu numai Ucraina, ne aparține culturii europene. Deci un oraș, a fost un oraș făcut de mari personalități cu rădăcini italienești, spanioli, franceze și vâna asta culturală, adică valorile culturale, a rămas, a rămas în oraș. Este teatru de opera, deci este Universitatea Națională care se chema Novorosischi Universitate încă înainte, adică sunt atâtea instituții culturale mai noi. Aceeași Novorosischi. Da, așa se chema înainte, se chema Novorosischi Universitate. În vremea sovietică? Nu. Mai înainte? Mai înainte, deci în perioada aceea, de până la Revoluție, se chema Novorosischi Universitate. Și sigur că în perioada trecută, deci, la valorile culturale pe care le 
promova Odessa și le conserva în sine, s-au adunat și potențialul economic, Marea, portul Odessa, mai avem port Iliciovs, adică un port Iujnei și în ultimul timp lucrurile s-au mai diminuat în virtutea crizei economice, dar oricum iar rămân un mare centru. Sancțiunile împotriva Rusiei au afectat și activitatea economică de aici? Din câte am auzit eu, nu, nu au prea afectat, fiindcă sunt relații care le, le au și le mențin ei ăștia de aici, la nivel bilateral, la nivel de întreprinderi, de porturi, de... adică n-am auzit să fie mari dereglări în sensul ăsta legat de sancțiuni. În rest, vă zic, pentru mine Odessa este un oraș european, un oraș în care te simți liber, eu cel puțin mă simt liber, adică simt că nimeni nu mă, nu mă, nu mă încurc, adică nu mi schimb, adică... Puteți să vă desfășurați activitatea da, cum doriți, vă da, simțiți da, bine, da, se da. la dumneavoastră acasă aici, în Odessa. Da, da. da. și bănesc nu numai eu, dar și alte lucruri, pentru că este spiritul ăsta a libertății, un, un lucru care în alte părți nu-l simt, dar aici orașul o este un oraș larg. Vorbeam cu cineva, cu Cernăuște, de exemplu, e un oraș mai, cu străzi mai înguste, cu, dar aici larghețea asta, deschiderea asta europeană a fost pusă chiar în, în temerile lui, la începutul de lui și ceea ce rămâne și azi, oricum, se păstrează și simți, adică, simți bine, simți că nimeni nu are nevoie de tine și tu nu ai nevoie de nimeni, adică... Aceasta a fost călătoria noastră în Bugeac și Odessa. Am găsit o regiune a Bugeacului aflată parcă într-o provincie uitată a Ucrainei, dar care speră că tocmai diversitatea etnică pe care o revalorizează acum să o ajute să facă față provocării ruse. Am văzut o regiune situată într-unul dintre cele mai fierbinți puncte ale confruntărilor geopolitice actuale, o regiune a cărei stabilitate este cât se poate de fragilă și al cărei viitor cu greu poate fi prezis acum. O regiune situată atât de aproape de România, dar atât de departe în geografia noastră mentală. Și în sfârșit am văzut Odessa, un oraș care trăiește periculos în vecinătatea unei falii geopolitice, un oraș care își afirmă însă spiritul pragmatic și independent de probabil ultima avampost al Occidentului în lumea răsăriteană. Probably um, this mentality uh, was skipped in the last uh, months, and um, for me it's difficult to understand um, if the, the people, especially in uh, Bujak, how think that these people after the new success of Vladimir Putin. Now Vladimir Putin is the winner. Um, I fear. Ukraine um, lost the war and lost the peace. Um, and probably some people um, can have uh, many expectation um, from the Russia. I don't know. But um, from Romania, for Romania is very far. Um, geographic uh, is close. But even the, the feeling uh, when you are there, it's um, uh, the feeling of um, a big distance from Romania. But in reality, um, it's only 50 kilometers, 70 kilometers um, from Galatz to Ismail. It's one hour driving. Um, but the feeling is um, to be very, very far. Um, The links between um, people uh, are to uh, with Moldova, not with Romania. Um, the people that the Romanian speakers in uh, Bujac uh, went to study uh, in Chisinau in uh, Moldova, to study at high school, at university. Uh, there are many links with uh, um, Moldova. Links from the 
the empire. Um, with Romania, its visa regime is difficult to travel. Um, there are very few uh, Romanian initiatives uh, there. Um, Romania is not so, uh, so close. It's, it's very far uh, for, uh, for this region. Now the region became very important um, for, um, in order to, because it's uh, at the Black Sea, uh, at the Danube. It, for us, for me, it's difficult to, uh, to know what think, uh, what is in Vladimir Putin mind. That's all, but um, the, the region, it, it's a very, very, um, it's a lack of um, uh, knowledge in Romania for this region. Which is, which is why you produce the movie and you're trying to distribute it as widely as, as possible, to increase the knowledge in, in Romania about Yes, the that's the, the goal of the, yeah. uh, the movie, yeah. and uh, it's made for uh, public, for not, public, not uh, yet especially for the experts. Hanna, you are from Ukraine, and even more interestingly, you're from Odessa. Um, first of all, can you, what is your answer to Ovidius' question? Is it going to be the next military theater? Uh, is it going to, uh, is the region Odessa and then Bujak, is it, is it going to, uh, uh, to see more, more fights like the ones uh, last year? And then tell us a little bit your interpretation of the situation of this particular region, very complicated inter-ethnic uh, uh, composition if you want, but also how you see, how you see the relation with Kiev and, and everything that is going on in Ukraine. From, uh, from your point of view? Um, I try to be a as short as possible because every question that you raised uh, can take hours and hours. Uh, unfortunately, I don't speak Romanian, so I can't criticize what was there <laughs> or command, except of one mistake in the name of my boss. So I would better not tell him about it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I will tell you later. The question is that if we go step by step and reacting to one of the statements of a video, uh, the lost battle is not the lost war. So what is happening now in Donbass, first of all, is definitely not the end. So you can't say uh, who is winning, who is losing. It depends in which spheres, because the win that now Russia can have there, it is more as the uh, pot victory. I'm not sure if I'm correct in English, but meaning that you're losing more than you're winning if, if formally you're uh, perceived as the winner. Uh, because you definitely see the consolidation of the nation. You see the uh, evoke of the civil society of volunteers, of all other people who are really ready to fight for the country. Uh, two, three years ago, I couldn't imagine uh, people of Ukraine voluntarily uh, fight for, for the country and for its sovereignty. Uh, this level of patriotism was very low, and definitely these two years changed the situation a lot. If we go more to Odessa region, um, we just finished the uh, report that I brought just a few copies with me, if somebody will be interested in. Exactly, we were studying the local identity, separatism, and all potential that is there uh, on the south of Odessa region. And uh, we made, after all this conversation, we had a group of sociologists and political scientists making the survey, their focus group uh, talking with local politicians, and we uh, managed to uh, make several conclusions. First of all, that the level of separatism there is very low. The ideas of Bujak People's Republic or Bessarabian People's Republic are mostly produced outside of the region. So when you speak with people there, they totally can't understand from where these gossips are coming. Uh, the third title, they bring the Gagos People's Republic. I don't know why, but these three are perceived as the most. At the same time, the Gagosian minority there is the most pro-Ukrainian on the ground. Uh, the pro-Russian sentiments really exist, but they connect it more with the historical approach. Because for this land, the Russian Empire is something good, uh, because the Russian Empire gave them the free land when it was still um, the slavery in the Russian Empire. Then the Soviet Union came, again perceived as Russia, 
for these people who built the infrastructure there, who created some social benefits there. And then the Soviet Union collapsed, and this region, as any periphery region, um, started to be in decrease of the economy and social issues. So definitely, for many people there, it is more of the his Soviet nostalgia, which is associated with the Russia, that current perception of Russia and Putin as a benefit for them. Uh, the second is definitely that for these people it is economic. Well, especially when we studied the Moldovan villages, 90% of them are very connected with the Russian business in terms of, because they're agricultural, mostly vegetables producing, and these vegetables were totally bought and sold in Russia by the big supermarkets uh, chain. Definitely when the crisis started, this economic trade chain uh, was broken, at least for the last season, and many of the local Moldovan uh, villagers, they perceive it as uh, uh, definitely the threat for themselves that Russia was good for them. So, but that is more economic, but nothing with the ideology or something political for them. Uh, the third uh, thing that we really understood, that all the villages, if you look to the ethnic map, it is not that you have the exactly district, which is Moldovan district, which is Bulgarian district, which is Gagauzian. It is crazy intermix over there. So it is impossible to create the uh, separatism uh, sentiments just within one community. Because this community, they have very good relations between each other, but they never cooperate on such a le uh, on political level. So to imagine these three biggest uh, ethnic community to unite and to uh, show some kind of separatism against the central government, it's quite a difficult. At the same time, people on the ground are telling that we have here the same problem as Crimea had, that uh, Kyiv was not paying enough attention to our problems. For example, there is still no normal road of Dessarini. It is awful road. It's almost. Uh, absent road, and we call this road the road of life for these people, because it is something that connects them with the whole Ukraine. Uh, so they see that as uh, long as Kyiv will not pay attention to what is going uh, in infrastructure, in social sphere here, you will have problems uh, with not perceiving Kyiv as something important. That's why the local identity, Bessarabian identity, is more important for these people, but they um, stress that for the last year, or for our question, because we raised the question, how do you feel, first of all, you're Moldovan, you're Bulgarian, or you're a citizen of Ukraine? And these people said that this year, we answer on you, we are citizens of Ukraine. There is less and less people there. Definitely is a huge role of the church, because there is no Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Kyiv Patriarchy here, or there. It's only churches of the Moscow Patriarchy there, and now few places with the Romanian uh, Patriarchy that also have some problems because it is fighting between Moscow and Romanian uh, Patriarchy on the ground. Uh, so military actions, I, what I said there, I still believe it is not possible. The uh, social uh, destabilization is possible. It is possible the economic destabilization. And it is possible the um, uh, continuation of the terroristic acts, what we have in Odessa now, with all these bombs uh, in the night, uh, with no victims, but with uh, some destruction. So to create the feeling of the fear. The 2nd of May, the events that you saw there, uh, when we speak now with the people, many of them said that that was like a breeze out for people meaning that all that anger, frustration that was there, uh, it just went away. So now you, and many people who were bringing the oil to the fire, they escaped the country. So uh, the general perception that is still pro-Maidan, anti-Maidan, pro-war, anti-war people, but um, it is almost nobody who are ready for that event. And what was, I understand it's impossible about such events to say positive in them, However, when I speak with my colleagues from Nikolaev, especially in Kherson, they said, like, you know, your events of 2nd of May eased the situation in our regions because we looked how it can be and we united not to allow such events to happen in our cities. So in some way, this negative event, this tragic event of the 2nd of May calmed down the situation at least in 3,000 uh, regions. And maybe it's influenced also. In Vinnytsia or Chernovtsi, it was not that on the agenda. But in, in Nikolaev and Kherson, we were expecting because they are very near to uh, Crimea. So we're not losing the war yet. Give us some time. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. 
Dimitar, um, there is an important uh, Bulgarian minority, not only in Bujak, but in, uh, uh, throughout Ukraine. I think earlier in our conversation you mentioned 200,000, if I'm not mistaken. Um, does Bulgaria have any policies towards this minority? And uh, what is your answer to Ovidius' question? Well, <clears throat> thanks a lot for putting together this panel. It's uh, fascinating to be amongst friends here. And and I'm certainly there to learn as much as to share my, my views. Um, it's, it's very good to talk after Hannah because uh, she has the fresh perspective from the ground, as it were. Now, one thing to take into consideration before we get to Bujak is that um, the whole issue of Ukraine is very divisive in Bulgaria. It's, it is not, it's the contrast that you have in Romania where I think there is a bipartisan view on, on Russia, on, on the East. In Bulgaria, it's the other way around. In, in a way, Bulgaria probably will resemble Moldova uh, in terms of how the political sphere has been polarized, especially with the war in, in, in Donetsk, but even before with the referendum in Crimea. Um, when the referendum in Crimea took place, you had observers from the ultra-nationalist uh, side of the political spectrum on the ground. and um, the issue of the Bulgarian community throughout Ukraine was used as stalking holes to delegitimize the new government in Kiev. On the moment um, change happened when Yanukovych left, the provisional government was appointed. This episode with regional languages, the, the law that didn't get to be implemented, was blown out of proportions in certain segments of Bulgarian um, uh, public. Uh, sphere and, and the media. Um, it was all the more important because the timing coincided with huge polarization within Bulgaria itself, where the opposing sides were also aligned with different sides in the Ukrainian conflict. So there was a kind of overlap uh, that happened. Now, what happens later on uh, is very much an echo of, of, of this episode at the start of the war. Of course, we have a government change now uh, in Sofia, uh, which gravitates much more to um, pro-Western side, although there's several caveats there. I, I won't have the time to get deep into that. But it's safe to say that uh, the president and the foreign minister, who happen to be today uh, in Bucharest as we speak, uh, they very much uh, belong to the pro-Western, pro-Atlanticist side uh, of the political debate. And, and they're pushing a line on Ukraine, which is very much um, um, along the, uh, the lines of um, integrate Ukraine, give it a chance, uh, not scale down the sanctions, take a tough approach on uh, Russia, and so on and so forth. Now, the other side, uh, of course, never say that Russia has a point, but they'll say, well, both sides are guilty. Uh, it's not that the Ukrainians in Kiev, the government, um, some of them might call them a junta, but let's say, take some of the more mainstream speakers of, uh, or representatives of this position, say those uh, people in, in, in Kiev, uh, they're not uh, the pro-European liberal Democrats, they present themselves, we look how they treat uh, minorities. Now, Pavlo Klimkin was, and I'm getting to Bujak slowly building my way. Now, Pavlo Klimkin was in Sofia last week, and the number one issue that was raised in, by journalists, but also in political conversations, what happens with the Bulgarian community? The perception that has been peddled uh, in Sofia is that those people are disproportionately affected by mobilization. Figures, I think, speak of, of something very different. Uh, the official Ukrainian statistic is only 20 people mobilized and sent to Donetsk. Uh, but if you read and, and listen to some of the coverage you get from Bulgaria, and sadly, some of the discourse coming from the com leaders of the community over there, you get the perspective that it's only Bulgarians fighting in the Bolsova or, or, or Luhansk or, or what have you, uh, which cues the debate. Now, interestingly enough, up to the conflict, not many people cared about um, what we call the Bessarabian Bulgarians. And that's another footnote I should add, that uh, in the Bulgarian psyche there is no division between those living in Taraklia and in the Moldova site and those living in, in Bujak, 
it's part of the same community. But I don't think uh, it's been a vivid question. All their issues to do with uh, marginalization, economic poverty, never score high um, except uh, occasionally. Now the crisis in Ukraine has made uh, both the Socialist Party, but also the ultra-nationalist attacker and, and the patriotic front that is now supporting the, this government, uh, seizing on the opportunity to score points domestically. So I don't think there is a policy as such, uh, but those communities come very handy into the conversation because of domestic political reasons and because they kind of feed into domestic polarization on those issues. Which is a shame because uh, at the end of the day, if you look, take a broader historical view, uh, this part of Ukraine has been instrumental in, in Bulgarian history. Um, for, unfortunately, you, you didn't go to Bograd, uh, but in, in Bograd you have the oldest Bulgarian high school that has uh, given over the years many leading politicians, uh, cultural figures, and, 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 and so on. So, yeah, I invite you. Yes, uh, it's, it's worthwhile. Uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, it's, it's, it's a community that scores high. Now, secondly, the community itself, uh, from my perception, tends to be in what we described as the kind of nostalgic mold, uh, reminiscing about the good times of the Soviet Union, um, mostly voting for the party of regions, the same way they would vote communists in, in Moldova itself. Uh, so they belong to this side of the political debate in, 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 um, in Ukraine and, and also Moldova. Now, um, there's a word to be said, and I encourage you to read the report. I just had a pleasure to leave through. Um, there's a word to be said about local identities. Uh, the boundaries between those communities uh, are not as fixed. Um, my friend Tim Judo went to the region, and I, I saw his map over there from The Economist um, that, that he used. And he was genuinely interested in the Albanian community, which, by the way, migrated to Bessarabia from what's now northeastern Bulgaria. Those were Bulgarian Albanians, if you, were, if, if, if you will, together with the Gagos and the Bulgarians. Those were three communities moving together. And now Albanians and Bulgarians live side by side, and there's a lot of intermarriages. Uh, many Bulgarians speak Russian as, as, a, as a first language, so it's, it's not that the knowledge of Bulgarian is, is so widespread. Uh, and, and, and there's much more to be said about the ethnography of the region. Uh, but uh, from my understanding, boundaries are very fluid. And the overarching identity has been, for the most part, this kind of Soviet mindset, which doesn't mean you can politicize this one, as you did in Donbass, to um, foster unrest. Um, but um, this also puts limits to what Bulgaria can do, uh, especially given the lack of, of any policy. Now the latest is on the demand list is that maybe Bulgaria will be changing the visa policies, making it easier, because this government wants to make some concessions to the more nationalistic voices in the domestic debate. But I'm not sure what will come out, out of that. And my final word will be about the worst case scenario. I think we do hope that it won't happen. There won't be a People's Republic of the Bujak. But if it does happen, or something along those lines does happen, it will put Sophie in a very tight place because uh, it will increase polarization. Uh, there will be fights in the public sphere. There will be opposing positions. There won't be any coherent policy emerging. Uh, it will be just an attempt to patch up things domestically, and I don't think Bulgaria can be such a mover and shaker in this region. Uh, thank you. Before moving on to, to, to the Moldovan on the panel, I do want to take the opportunity which, um, um, uh, which Dimitar uh, uh, gave me and to um, announce you all that there is a new study published by GMF out. It's very fresh. I think we just, we just got it out last night on uh, the reactions of each country in Central and Eastern Europe uh, towards the events in Ukraine, including Bulgaria, but starting with the, with the Baltic countries, all the way down if you want. Yes, that was not the point of my intervention, <laughs> but yes, there is this study out there, which is really, really very interesting. It does show the reaction of other countries in Central and Eastern Europe, but I do want to, uh, to, uh, uh, to come to the Moldovan and the pan um, on the panel um, and ask you to, to comment but not to comment, but to explain to us a little bit the relation between um, Moldova and, uh, and Bujak, and even more importantly, the relation between Gagauzia and Bujak. Uh, 
And also, I don't. I, I think I only heard Transnistria mentioned once in your movie. Was it right? Transnistria. You only, only mentioned it once. By hand. By hand. Of course. Yes. Of course. Um, maybe you also want to bring this uh, this into the conversation, Cornell. I will try. F thank you very much for for this invitation. Uh, okay, I am a political scientist. I pretend to be it, it at least, and that's why I will uh, try to to have a political geopolitical uh, approach to 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 this region, which is called Budjak, but uh, I. I don't think that in Moldova people understand what Buchak really is and what we think in terms. For us, you are right, exists Gagauzia, for example. For us, exists there is such a rayon as Teraklia, which is pop populated by Bulgarians. But we don't use the term uh, Buchak very frequently, and I think Ukrainians don't do this too. Uh, I think even uh, Romanians discovered recently this, this uh, topic. Why we know? Because uh, uh, you mentioned a video about um, uh, Russians' plan to, to 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 create a republic, and uh, Hannah also told. No, no, but you, you, I, I saw it. But in fact, Ukrainians published it. First, we took over, and after that, you, no, no, you took it directly from Ukrainians, as I saw in, in your sources. So it is uh, this plan to organize some. Uh, disturbances in the region which provoke these kind of discussions. And, uh, okay, for us, for Moldovans, uh, the, our relationship with Ukrainian part of Budjak are minimal. Of course, we think about the Romanians who live there, but this is another kind of Romanian people or Moldovan people. You know, in, Moldo in Moldova, there are three kinds of Moldovans. There are Moldovans who are pro-Romanian, who speak, who consider themselves to be Romanians, and who are unionists. They speak Romanian language, and it's clear with them. They are not a majority. There are uh, simple Moldovans who can admit, who could admit that they speak Romanian, but they don't want to unification with, uh, with Romania. This is the majority of Moldovans. And there is another third kind of uh, Moldovans. These are Transnistrian Moldovans. Uh, Transnistrian Moldovans and I think Bujak Moldovans are very similar to Transnistrian Moldovans. It's a totally another kind of, of being a Moldovan. They don't accept uh, any kind of Romani uh, Romanianism. They think about the majority of Moldovans to be too much Romanized, despite the fact that they even can say that they speak Moldovans. But in their point of view, Moldovans, Moldovans are spoiled by Romanianism. They are not true Moldovans, because they are spoiled by Romania. So uh, I think that's why it's very difficult to accept uh, Bujak Moldovans as pure Moldovans, because they are not totally uh, Moldovans in our understanding. And of course, you know this discussion between Romania and Ukraine, where Moldova is also involved. Uh, what kind of Moldovans are in Budjak? Are they Romanians or not? Or, or are they Moldovans? So it's a big discussion, big issue. Uh, Moldova, as far as I know, is having such a uh, ha has a hesitation here. Is not declaring openly what is in uh, your mind, in our mind. But in fact, I think objectively looking at Moldovans from Budjak, they are, they are third kind of Moldovans, unfortunately for Romanians. Um, yeah, and this is our relationship with, uh, with Budjak. Uh, as for, for us, for Moldovans, we consider that there is no such notion as Budjak. Uh, there is Ukrainian Bessarabia, it's their topic, their discussion, we don't want to, to consider it, but there is our South and Bessarabia or uh, these two problematic region, Gagauzia, uh, autonomous region, and to, to much less extent, Taraklia. And here we have a really a, a big problem. You know that uh, last year uh, they organized a referendum uh, in Gagauzia, Gagauzian, organized two referendums 
on the topic to, of European Union, if to support for European Union or not, and if uh, Moldova will change its status, for example, will become a member of European Union, which is not written explicitly, but it is in their mind, they could uh, begin to separate from Moldova. So they organized these two referendums and they tried to involve also Bulgarians from Taraklia in this political affair. Uh, they, to some extent, failed, probably due to maybe Sofia intervention, maybe due to our Secret Service intervention, because we have to use this kind of tools in such kind of uh, very risky atmosphere, but Taraklia Bulgarians behaved in, uh, they didn't involved they even didn't organize consultations, as they declared, uh, about these issues. Uh, Gagauz uh, autonomy organized this referendum, which were declared illegal by, by Kishinev, but still they, they organized them. And of course there are different rumors regarding the, the plans maybe of Russia, but these are rumors, no, 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 nothing concrete, about great idea of having a great Gagauzia. It's quite a logical, maybe geopolitical idea to unite Gagauzia from, uh, from Moldova with Gagauz from Ukraine. Uh, there are rumors in Moldova. I know that of our, of our Bashkan, Bashkan is governor of Gagauzia for Buzal. When he visited Moscow, he had some discussions about this. So these plans cannot be neglected totally. So there are, we can say if we speak in terms of fragmentation in terms of separations, we could have three different political entities in this region. We could have big Budjak, including uh, Ukrainian Budjak and Moldovan part of Budjak. We could have small Budjak, which is Bulgarians and Gagauz together. I am speaking hypothetically, it's nothing concrete, but I think geostrategists geo have this idea in mind. And we could have great Gagauzia which is uh, very dear to the hearts of some people in Moldova. Uh, as Hanna told us, uh, in Ukraine, uh, Gagauz people are very uh, pro-Ukrainian. In Moldova, they are pro-Russian, so maybe this is a kind of fraction. Uh, uh, how, how serious are these scenarios? Okay, in Moldova, we don't think that they are very serious. Uh, and uh, one of the explanations is that it's very difficult. The Budjak, so-called Budjak, is multi-ethnic. It was mentioned, and it's very difficult to uh, to join different uh, uh, people with different mentalities. But one thing I think is uh, is uh, of big concern: the majority of people in this region are pro-Russians, at least in our in Moldova, and anti-European, or maybe at least neutral toward this, but I think mostly uh, anti-European. So this is a potential to use in geopolitical game for Russia to, to create disturbances, and we really managed to do it during these two, two years. So we, have, we will have this, uh, in one month in March elections in uh, Gagauzia for Bashkan, and perhaps very good chances to win as a candidate which is supported by Moscow. So we don't know what will follow after that, but, uh, but Irina Vlach, who is uh, uh, the candidate with good chances to win, is openly supported by, by Moscow. Uh, and just one remark, I am not quite sure that in uh, Ukrainian Budjak there are just 4% of Moldovans. I think, I think they are more than... More than in, in Ismail. Ah, in Ismail, yeah, it could be, yeah. Okay. Thank you. About our identities, uh, uh, it's a nice example in the movie, uh, the singer uh, from um, Tarmi's uh, band uh, is from Ismail. Um, the band is from uh, Kishino. Um, he went to, his, uh, to Kishino to study, uh, to touch success uh, like musician, and after that he went in Romania to participate participate uh, to um, the contest uh, Vocea Romaniei and uh, he take the second place in Vocea Romaniei in, uh, in Romania. Uh, he's a Moldovan in um, uh, Ismail, 
I don't know what is uh, uh, in uh, Chisinau, but probably it's a Romanian one uh, in Vocea Romaniei. Hanna, you had another remark and then we'll turn on to questions. And uh, yeah, just a few remarks, uh, very small, but fr from what was going on. Uh, uh, first of all is that it's quite a difficult to know because the latest census was in 2001, official census. According to that census, only 5% of the Moldovans in Odessa region. Depending on the district within Odessa region, for example, in Rini, you have 49%. The question is that uh, was not a question in 2001, but very uh, uh, important now, that it is the migration between Romanian and Moldovan self-identification. Uh, a lot of people there perceive themselves exactly as not Romanians, but Moldovans, and many insist that they are Moldovans, not Romanians. At the same time, it's quite an active work of some Romanian cultural societies and some groups trying to persuade more and more people that they are Romanians. It is semi-ethnical uh, issue, semi-political issue, because depending, um, like every ethnic minority can have the subsidies from the government for their newspapers, TV channels, radio, schools, wherever. So sometimes it is good to be two different um, ethnic groups. The second is that um, what is interesting, we have the huge Bulgarian minority, which is extremely politically active. Uh, we have the member of parliament uh, of the Bulgarian uh, region, uh, exactly from Belgrade, but he is very active to secure the Gagosian rights. He is like patronizing. Um, at the same time, Bulgaria is much further to us. If we go to uh, Moldovans, they are the least active. And one of the examples, you can imagine that in Rini, where for 49 years, 49% uh, uh, are Moldovans, for 23 years of independence, there were any head of the district of the Moldovan region. None of them. So in the very, very region of being there. Concerning the Gagauzians, it's very interesting. They are pro-Ukrainian state, but not pro-European. They are very, with a specific position, one of the reasons that they in the very good connection, uh, personal, there is any official connections on, I don't know, cultural societies, wherever, but on the personal family connections with the Moldovan Gagauzians, and they have these myths of Romanization and unity of the country, which they're afraid. So, I mean, like, it is going as a broken radio from one to another, so it is really strange position of Gagauzians being pro-Ukrainian, but in some way anti uh, European. With Albanians, that is interesting why we even were not studying them. Um, they don't like, they still exist in the cultural, that is um, Arnaut, as we called because of the Turkish um, villages, but at the same time, uh, in the political life, you almost can't find them. Uh, they are not uh, active, and when you go, it is mostly these three ethnic groups. And for me, it was strange that you put Lipovani. Because you can't find in the official census Lipovani. Lipovani are more perceived as the religious rather than ethnics. So by the numbers, it will be totally different perception if you go to the official self-identification of the people. Um, and with this, I will turn to, to, to the audience for questions that you might have to the panelists or for comments that you might have either on the movie or what, on what uh, has been said here. I don't know if we have a microphone. Hello. Uh, I would like to, to ask yeah, Julian Kifu. My name is Julian Kifu. I'm the president of the Conflict Prevention and Early Warning Center. And I would like to address first to Hannah, but everybody from the panel can take it. At what respect did you see differences of reaction in the developments in Ukraine from the so self-identify Romanians and self-identify Moldovans? In, in this region. Thank you. Christian, Mr. Tello, journalist, alluded to this, uh, but I want to reinforce the point or ask the question rather. Uh, there have been, of course, many mistakes in terms of misreading the situation in Ukraine by the European foreign offices, including the Romanian one probably, misreading the intentions of uh, Russia and Putin. And uh, I think a lot of stress is still being put on uh, nationalities and their positions within these countries. 
Um, to my mind, uh, this is overblown because most of these populations have been to a great extent Sovietized. They have adopted the Russian language, the Russian culture, the Russian system, the Soviet system. As there is an element of nostalgia to which you referred. They felt more secure, they felt more protected under the Soviet Union and uh, hence uh, they are against the new identities, the new countries which have emerged from the Soviet Union. It doesn't, it's, it's not uh, so much a, a national identity which is in conflict, but uh, a conflict of mentalities, I think. The other thing is about the uh, descriptions of people who call themselves Moldavians or Romanians and a lot of uh, paper has been used to write about this. Um, again, I think it is overblown. Uh, in my family, my father's family come from Romanian Moldova, so to say, and uh, as they, they were quite a, quite a few of them, and there were occasional disputes between uh, my grandmother, who is born in 1866, and uh, sons-in-law, daughters-in-law. Some, some of the disputes were about culinary matters, my grandmother always said, we Moldavians do it this way. We Moldavians think it's better to put more butter or whatever. So uh, the, the stress was on them being Moldavians, although they were clearly Romanians and were very proud of being Romanians, but they stressed this regional dimension, which now has taken a different dimension because <laughs> a country has emerged taking the name of Moldova and nobody protested when that happened by the matter, by, by the way. I'll try to do it short. Um, one of the, uh, I will start from the end if possible, because um, one of the reasons we started this research, because there were too many manipulation and the use of information saying that it can be some nationalistic within these minority, ethnic minorities on the south, as the um, conflict factor for the future. So our task was to understand, is it really anything from the ethnic and nationalistic uh, sentiments there? And uh, uh, one of the uh, conclusions we came that the ethnicity doesn't play that role, uh, that is tried to be manipulated in some of the central media, uh, because unfortunately it is also manipulated by some Ukrainian <laughs> media as well. Uh, one of the reports about the possibility of the Bessarabian or Bujak People Republic was published by the Ukrainian think tank. Uh, so uh, definitely it is more of the uh, use of this factor rather than the reality on the ground. Uh, the biggest idea for people is definitely mentality. Um, it is the perception of the demonstrations as something not understandable and it is the huge gossips and disinformation sent to this region because on the south of Odessa region most of the people have their um, satellite so they watch Russian TV and because they watch uh, the same in Moldova is the very serious factor. Um, the result is that uh, many of them was uh, perceiving in the wrong way what was happening in Kiev last uh, winter, uh, what was happening later. Uh, so only now we are starting to work with the information, organizing roundtables in Ismail, not in Odessa, on many issues. And people are saying like, thanks that you are coming, at least somebody is talking with us. So for many of them, they were not interested in the politics before. So it just came with this um, mental perception uh, of w what is uh, happening over there. Concerning the difference in reaction between Moldovans and Romanians, uh, we couldn't witness it that much. Uh, what is interesting, uh, Maybe with those who are more Romanians, and that is the same with the uh, um, Bulgarians, uh, the phrase was said by the head of the uh, Cultural Center of Bulgarians in Odessa. Uh, he said that because our mother state is in the European Union, we see what is the perspective in it. We can't say that we are so much pro-European integration because we see what problems it can have for the transition, but at the same time, we understand that if our mother state is there, so some positive changes can come to Ukraine because of the European integration. 
And uh, uh, from this, like this double citizenship was always a problem of the um, not self-identification, <laughs> but the uh, possibility for mobility, uh, for just traveling, for employment. And they that's why they traveled a lot. They saw what does mean Romania in the European Union, Bulgaria in the European Union. So these uh, categories are a little bit more pro-European in this term. But it doesn't mean that they are so much pro-Kiev. Because it, it's political, but at least they don't say junta, because, sorry, junta is the military government. To imagine these guys who never fought before the military government is nonsense for me. I would like to address these two questions. The first one regarding conflict of mentalities or ethnic, inter-ethnic conflict. I'm speaking now about Moldova. Of course, the big dispute is about uh, mentalities, pro-Russian or pro-European. That's true. But in fact, in reality, there is a small dispute, which for us, for Moldova, is much more important. And the uh, small dispute is inter-ethnic. There is Kishinev, which represents Moldovans to a big extent. And there is Gagauzia, which is a very active actor with 60% of the population uh, who would like to attract in this game of interrelationship between Kishinev and Comrade, which is the capital of Gaguzia, Bulgarians. So they would like to include uh, Bulgarians' villages in its autonomy and to strengthen the autonomy of uh, Gagauzia. And they also try to enhance the autonomy and to create, to create a strong pole, maybe potentially also to uh, in future to, to start uh, discussions with Ukrainians, Ukrainian Gagauz. So for us, for Moldova, it is also an uh, inter-ethnic conflict, which is totally separated from the discussion, uh, theoretically, it is separated from uh, discussions about Euro Europe or not. And uh, for us, it is a discussion to create a sovereign st state. Discussion about Europe is to, in a way, to to, I don't know, to uh, adjust to European standards, to lose, in a way, some sovereignty. And this is a big problem. Now Europeans start to understand that Moldovans, before discussing about Europe, should have a, a state. And this is quite a dilemma for us. Um, and uh, about the Moldovans' uh, regional or state identity. It's a difficult topic. Even for us, it is very confusing. But of course, Moldovans from Romania, it is a regional identity. They are Romanians as uh, first identity and second class identity is to be Moldovans. For Moldovans in Moldova, to be Moldovan is a state identity. It's another kind of identity. Uh, it is an identity which is number one identity for many of them, not for, for all of us. And uh, again, it is a kind of mythical identity because real Moldova created Romania. But for us to be Moldovan is not to be in Romania in a way. So it is a, a not, we don't understand quite correct what does Moldova mean for us, but we don't want to speak about this. Real Moldova is in Transnistria and in uh, Bujak, because what Moldova is, is what is not Romania. And what is not Romania is what uh, people who don't recognize that they speak Romanian, who don't want to be Romanians, and the real, these real people are, are in Ukraine and Transnistria. So that's why to be Moldovan in Moldova is a, a contradiction in terms. And that's why our Romanian friends explain us very politely that, in fact, you are Romanians and they are right. But also the Transnistrians are saying that if you would accept that you are Romanian, forget about the unification with, with, uh, with Transnistria. So uh, oh, this is also should be understood. Any more questions or comments? The discussion has um, covered mostly the identity dimension, but some of the, the efforts of, of uh, Ovidio and his team uh, in documenting the region also looked at uh, institutions, uh, institutional structures, center versus regional uh, administrative uh, instruments. Hannah, you alluded to that as well. Uh, 
uh, but also to the economy. And one of the questions raised there and addressed to some extent by, through the sub subjective lens of the respondents, whether the, the sanctions and the crisis with, uh, in relationship between Ukraine and Russia has impact on the local economy, and somehow people are brushing this off as Odessa has always been uh, a Porto Franco, we do our own way, whether the Moldovanka style or, or through trade, we can deal with this. But war changes that pattern. So now going a little bit beyond just the documentary, um, the impact of the conflict is felt in, in, throughout Ukraine and the region. And I think that the report that you find in the files uh, done by the Aspen Institute for the US Chamber um, covers particularly the, the, the cost of war. Not just in terms of the real cost of fighting, but uh, of the lost opportunity to focus on necessary forms of um, stopping some of the organic relationships that were developing there, where the free trade association, uh, both for Moldova and for Ukraine, could have been li literally, uh, um, given the, you know, the economic growth of those region, a factor for modernization in the region, to, to some extent, compensate the uh, the, the fact of using identity as a dividing factor rather than uh, a defining factor. Um, I came late, uh, Mirja Joanna here. I apologize, but um, I was very intrigued by the angles. And I think it's a very sophisticated conversation. National, regional, sub-regional, cultural identities, war, whatever. But my question to the panel is, there is always another relationship between the center and the periphery. It's always been like this in human history. So my more precise question is, if and when, or when or if, the free trade agreements between Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia for that matter, will eventually come into effect, how do you think this will alter the dynamics between the two competing centers and one periphery. Uh, because in fact, this is what we have. We have a geopolitical contest, but also a geoeconomic and cultural. And probably if we find an answer to the center of gravity, which is the most attractive, the most, let's say, compelling, uh, the most magnetic, if you want, center, then we could eventually think of micro, regional, uh, cooperation. This is one angle. I, I think this is, in fact, where the whole thing started. That Russia felt that the geoeconomic change of balance will alter the geopolitical balance. That's, at least in my simplistic, Julian and others are more, let's say, more into this in, in, in depth. This is the first, the, the second sub question into this. As we, I was very intrigued uh, to see. Ukrainian officials coming to us at the Aspen Institute in Romania and asking us about a maritime cluster that we're trying to build between Braila, Galați, uh, uh, Sulina, Constanza, Mangalia, and also saying, listen, also there is Reni, there is Odessa. Why don't we try to create more synergy? Also, Giorgiulești, uh, the only Danubian port of Moldova. So my second question, or Cernăuți, Chișinău, Iași, how do you see this, let's say, more practical anchors, which is about business and uh, infrastructures and uh, you know, border crossing points easier to be crossed than today. Uh, so the, sec the first one is, let's say, more geoeconomic. How do you think that uh, this, this, this uh, competition between two centers of economic power will, will impact our conversation? And secondly, how do you think that the more uh, microscopic, more nitty-gritty kind of thing uh, would eventually help accelerate the process um, of creating a more homogeneous, if you want, if not totally homogeneous, at least something that will make more sense. Uh, this will be a question, of course, to, to the panel. And this is this is a question. Uh, you're absolutely right. That at the end of the day, the Vilnius summit that uh, triggered everything was about the trading system and the economy. I think um, getting the deep uh, free trade uh, agreement working uh, is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. 
because Ukraine is on the verge of bankruptcy and what really remain and now the policy debate is about the war and, and arming and but I think there is a long term game for everyone in the EU which is how you stabilize Ukraine. Um, how you um, give financial assistance but uh, at the same time condition reforms uh, in the governance sector, uh, in the fiscal sector and so on and so forth to make Ukraine viable over the long term which will, by the way, also defeat the narrative that Ukraine is a quasi-state or a failed state that you hear um, uh, reverberating from all kinds of um, media outlets in Moscow. Uh, and it won't be an easy uh, feat. I think now the ball is in the court of European politicians, because if you say that you're not arming Ukraine, then you have to give an alternative. I think I not, need not mention the, the name Germany uh, here. Um, what, what is on offer as, as a financial package. I certainly, um, um, I can understand if Angela Merkel is, is in a tight spot because now um, you have all those critics um, arguing against the bailout of Greece. Do we need another one? Uh, Ukraine is even bigger. Do we need to cough up more money? And now the regional elections in Hamburg gave uh, an alternative for Deutschland even seats regionally, but there's a strategic game there to be played and it's, we're not talking so, about such an enormous amount of money at the end of the day, IMF is evolved. Um, if the economy is stabilized, then you can make full of use of the liberalized, liberalized trading regime. Um, I'm not sure how it will impact on the ground there because the structure of the economy is, is probably very different in Bujak compared to uh, elsewhere and the agricultural sector is big and this is not covered freely by, uh, by the agreement, but uh, we are talking the macro level uh, and Ukraine has to be given a helping hand to weather the storm, whatever remains of Ukraine, because we, I mean, the best case scenario is a frozen conflict, but we should be planning for um, stabilizing the rest of the country and, and making it an economics, well, maybe not success story, but at least uh, moderately viable. And, and, and growing, which is easier said than done, obviously. Uh, for us, frozen conflict, as the history of the neighboring countries showed, is the worst scenario. Um, first of all, because the, when it is frozen, it can be melted every moment, and it's always the leverage over here. I will start from the more optimistic things, and that is to your last question about the um, uh, cooperation on the ground. Um, I see the perspective quite a positive, uh, even that for many years it was quite a neglected in some way because it is quite a serious competition. For example, cooperation between Odessa and Constanza, I see it quite impossible because these two seaports are the biggest competitors. Uh, at the same, uh, the same with the Danube channels that we had, and it's quite a long in, uh, point in the relations of two countries. But when you go to the smaller ports and the cooperation between the borders, uh, villagers, uh, they have quite a serious perspective. What make me um, optimistic? First of all, uh, that now it is in already very, it, is, uh, it has been initiated, so I hope it is just a question of months that we will have it. It is the finally ferry between uh, Orlovka and uh, um, Romania. So this ferry really will help, because from Odessa to Bucharest, it took me 22 hours to get last night. So 22 hours. There is no direct flights, there is no direct trains, there is no direct uh, buses. 22 hours by car, if you drive personally, it is nine hours at least, in case you are lucky with the road, because now after winter road is even worse uh, than was was uh, there. So uh, more and more of this uh, just simple infrastructure projects will help. The second is that we are expecting visa-free regime with the uh, European Union by the end of this year. So uh, uh, it will also help, even that now with Romania we have this uh, special regime for the border villagers and they can e more easily uh, uh, travel. And uh, there are two big projects sponsored by the European Union that in the near months will initiate their financial assistance. One is uh, Eastern Partnership Territorial Cooperation Program Ukraine-Moldova and another one is Ukraine-Moldova-Romania. 
uh, uh, program uh, uh, we just finished the first circle and uh, uh, in a month or two they make a call for the next one uh, economic development local economic development and infrastructure are among the priorities of two so it seems to me that this will develop more and more uh, if we go to the upper level it's definitely the issue that um, we now can't calculate what are the real steel for this region, not for the whole Ukraine. What are the real expenses that we paid or our losers? Uh, the south of Odessa region is agricultural territory, first of all. So um, only in spring and in summer when they will get their harvest and when they start to sell it, we will understand whether the real possibility is or not. So uh, for that region, it's very difficult to calculate it in any of the um, real numbers. Uh, the choice for them, it seems to me it can happen as with um, uh, Georgia, when for the first time uh, Russia boycotted their wine, it took them several months to find the new markets. And they say that definitely we had Sounds like three, four months of huge lose in money. But then, thanks to Russia, we diversified our markets and in two, three years perspective, we gained. So maybe uh, it can be also the issue for this region because in, in big numbers, they don't produce that much not to be able to sell it somewhere. And because Ukraine will not be able, because of this currency exchange crisis now, to buy something from Balkans, and for example, we had it from Croatia, one of the biggest scandals was last summer when the Croatian cabbage came to Ukrainian market. Moldovan villages and uh, Utkonosovka, for example, it was almost demonstrations why we had our own cabbage and you're buying in Croatia. Well, so, um, at that time, it was more about other uh, schemes. But anyway, that is the real question that uh, in case now we will not be able to buy like this, we will buy more and more on the internal market. Uh, just to choose between the uh, association agreement and uh, uh, Eurasian Union. It seems to me nobody believes anymore in Eurasian Union because even Belarus and Kazakhstan don't believe in it. Uh, so that is not an option anymore. Uh, just Russia, uh, just Putin. That, that's, that's the question, but it's not anymore an economy because it seems to me that Russian economy daily is losing also a lot. So for them just to destabilize in this way will be difficult. It can be more because of other, uh, for transport. So not the agriculture, but for this region, transport sphere is quite a serious. And you have Ismail seaport and Odessa seaport. Russians tried to buy Yuzhny seaport. They were not lucky in it. Uh, but in Ismail, the person who came now as a member of parliament from there is a good friend of mine, young guy, not pro Poroshenko, so he's from the up, nowadays opposition, but completely pro Ukrainian and trying to get as much as possible for the modernization and gaining possibilities from the European Union integration in terms of trade. Because he just understands we are more money and we are more perspectives. Yeah, for businessmen, they understand that they need to invest in it because you can't be with the same standards of business. But uh, uh, the choice for 90%, it seems to me, is already made. Um, economical links between uh, Romania and uh, the region uh, south of uh, Odessa region are mostly absent. Um, when I prepare my trip, um, I find a solution uh, to go there, not by our car, but um, in, um, by a bus or by a ship at the Danube, for example, and to rent a car there. Uh, and it was impossible. Um, I search um, many ways and I find um, a bus from Varna to Odessa 24 hours uh, on the way from Varna. Um, the bus uh, stop in Constanza, uh, but only if uh, it's uh, someone to, um, uh, to go, yes, uh, to, to pick uh, the, the bus. Otherwise, uh, they don't stop. Uh, they ask you, um, let us uh, very sure if you um, want to go or not, because we don't stop. Um, by um, ship uh, it's impossible, but 
Ismail is the main port, uh, Ukrainian port at the Danube, but no link with uh, any uh, Romanian port in the Danube. Uh, it could be very interesting to uh, have a trip uh, from Tulcea to Ismail uh, uh, by boat uh, and uh, to film, uh, to, to, to take uh, pictures and images, but it was impossible. Yes, it is uh, winter, it was in, in winter, uh, but also uh, they are not in the summertime, no. It's impossible to, um, to cross the Danube from Romania to uh, Ukraine um, in Kilia River. That's a, a reality. Um, and the, the border it's, um, is there. You, you can show what, uh, how is the border uh, in, in the movie. It's uh, the... Uh, yes, yeah. Like in Cold War. Just, I, I didn't get exactly uh, with the first question. Was it, it was mentioned about uh, geoeconomic competition between two economic powers. Do you mean the uh, EU and Eurasian Economic Union? In fact, we don't see like this. Uh, we don't see a geoeconomic economic competition between two economic powers. There is no such thing. For two years, we have a war between these two powers using proxy countries. So uh, this is what how we perceive. And to speak about economy in this uh, context is, mm, I think it's not uh, a, a right approach. Um, and I don't see multilateralism in the region. Two, uh, a trilateral was creating between Romania, Ukraine, Ukraine and Moldova, but Romania, which is in fact should be the leader, in, I think, in this uh, regional context, due to more favorable position, uh, in fact, transformed trilateral transborder cooperation in bilateral uh, transborder cooperation. So now we speak about uh, Moldova, Romania, Moldova cooperation and Romania, Ukraine cooperation, not a trilateral. So, in fact, um, uh, how to say it? It's it's not quite. Uh, it's not a multilateral approach here in the region, and each business businessman is trying to to use uh, this uh, hidden strategy of business, shadow economy. Yeah, this kind of business is working here in the region. Yes, the, the good news uh, comes from, from uh, Galati. Uh, there is a market, um, Piazza Rushilor, the Russian market, um, where um, the people from um, Djurjulesht, from Kahul, and even from Ren um, come to sell um, vegetables and other things. Uh, there. The people try to make something, uh, but that's not enough. Thank you very much, uh, Moresh Aneuris Foundation. Um, you mentioned that uh, we don't have uh, this kind of cooperation on the Danube, Romania and Ukraine, but uh, you forgot that we had the Stroy event, so it was a quite quite close cooperation some years ago when we had this incident about uh, the Danube and who is guilty and how to solve the problem. So coming back, uh, congratulations for the, the film on the mental map. It's something like uh, an area where uh, on the old maps was Hicksont Leones. Nobody knows what's exactly there. We have to go to discover. And Hannah explained us that uh, due to the fact that you had not the chance to have something bloody you succeed to manage the situation last year. Uh, we discovered that area not by Christian Anampur and CNN, but by our colleague Ovidio Nahoy. So coming back to, to Hannah, and uh, uh, you are in, in, in front of uh, uh, German, Chinese, Arabs, investors choosing to come to Odessa. Which are the three main strong points to stay there and to give a chance to the area and to the young generation. Hi, Laurencio Colentinano. I had a, a question that uh, I don't know if it excludes our participant from, from the Ukraine or not, um, but I would uh, mainly direct it to uh, Dimitar in the video. 
Um, the, the situation that you described on a bilateral cooperation regarding Romania, I'm sure it's the same way in Bulgaria, is in my opinion a direct result of a lack, a virtual lack of political relations uh, until last year, at least in Romania's case, when we signed the small traffic border agreement. Uh, now, I would admit that Romanian authorities would run against the brick wall when it came uh, to Yanukovych, um, but I think that it, that's at least, uh, or that's most, mostly half of the guilt. Um, I think we carry a burden of not being able to develop effective bilateral political relations. We don't even have a direct flight from Bucharest to Kiev, let alone from Bucharest to Odessa, no disrespect intended. Uh, so our capitals aren't linked by a direct flight. Um, what would you uh, recommend from your position uh, to be done in order to develop these political relationships so that uh, those small scale projects do have a foundation to grow on? Thank you. Thank you. I'll try to, um, to be brief. I'm from the Romanian MFA and I won't uh, try, you know, to fight back uh, past my, the previous uh, <laughs> no chance, okay. Um, just, um, just to make a short comment, uh, I mean, I'll start actually by addressing a question, first of all, to all the speakers that uh, feel that might jump in and provide an answer. How was the partial mobilization um, uh, reaction, I mean the reaction to the partial mobilization in Odessa felt, if any, because we are aware, I mean here uh, in, in, uh, in the Romanian society, the, pub, uh, the, the fourth wave of, of the pa um, partial mobilization has raised vivid emotions. And um, I, I take the opportunity to, to commend the, the initiative uh, of, of making this movie um, who actually offers very sharp nuances and deep insight uh, within the multi-layered, let's say, I wouldn't say Ukraine, but regions of Ukraine, because Odessa in itself is, is standing out. I can speak for myself of Chernobyl, it's because I've been based with the OSE mission, special monitoring mission, so um, I gained myself a lot of insight over there, which is very different from Odessa. So the question, uh, one first question would be whether you would have an, in, an initiative to make, to replicate basically, to, uh, to, to make another movie about Chernobyl. It would, <laughs> it would be worthwhile. Um, so that would be a, a question that, uh, that, that first, uh, the mobilization in Odessa, and it's, it's, uh, it's for all the speakers, because I'm sure that you'll have your personal uh, experiences <laughs> with, uh, with the interaction of Odessa. Um, another interlocutor said uh, here has highlighted that um, uh, the war, the armed conflict in, in, in Ukraine, is differently felt and perceived in different regions of Odessa. For myself, I know that back in 2010, there was an initiative, a very good one, from an NGO, Ukrainian NGO, who made a study um, precisely on these three regions, Donbas, Crimea, and Chernobyl, or Chernobyl, um, how the public would perceive the identity of, this, of the people living in these regions. And the outcome of, the blunt outcome of, of the study, five years back, is that the perception was modified through propaganda, through public sources, which were distorted. So the point that I want to make is now that the propaganda and fighting propaganda basically would, um, would feature high and strategically, more than the tactically, let's say, um, in the current context. And I think that this movie, this movie besides um, giving us a deep insight in the you know, Tessa case, is a very good one showing how worthwhile it is to fight back propaganda. It poses a lot of questions and indeed Hannah said very well that, uh, <laughs> rightly so, we can sit for hours and hours and uh, we couldn't finish uh, all the topics. Um, you put the, the question of mindset, of course the mindset is very important. 
um, it was raised the issue of artificial identities, um, I mean identities, mentalities being artificially created. I would provide the sole example. In Chernowitz, in Chernowitz, there is, um, it's not a monument of Mihai Minescu, it's um, on a public building, the high school where Mihai Minescu studied, it's written that Mihai Minescu is a national poet, Romanian poet, and the national, and equally, a national Moldovan poet. So that, <laughs> that's a telling example of identities. <laughs> okay, so that's only one insight. Um, okay, thank you so much. Economics, I think the connections are uh, essential. And um, speaking of connections, uh, there is an interesting um, railway connection between Chisinau and Odessa. Uh, very modern uh, trains made by Gruya Stoica, the Romanian industrial. Um, but for Romanians it's impossible uh, to go um, from Chisinau to Odessa by train. Uh, because the line uh, pass uh, to Transnistria. So, uh, like Romanian, uh, you have to find another um, way. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> so and th this is a way. Uh, yes, the, the, infra the infrastructure is uh, essential. Um, I think... Um, um, the region, uh, the region is um, uh, too peripheric for Ukraine um, for be so so important uh, at the central level. Um, I think the local initiative is uh, is very important. It's very important to give substance to uh, Euro region um, uh, low Danube that exists, but uh, the activity is not uh, so. Uh, in so big, I think, and uh, the, the treaty of uh, small traffic uh, will be important. I think it's uh, the problem is in the Ukrainian parliament. Uh, the Romanian parliament approve uh, this treaty, uh, but the links, the links, uh, the infra infrastructure is uh, essential. I want just to continue the idea of uh, the links and. Just to say good words for the Romanian ambassador in Moldova, because he really did, probably he is the first ambassador who, who managed to improve the image of Romania in Transnistria. And it was done by means of several very good projects, and uh, I think this good uh, job should be continued. I, not just with Transnistria, but in Budjak too. Oh, thanks. Hello, Ciprian Stanisco from the Aspen Institute. Uh, congratulations, Ovidio, for, for the movie and, and for the trip. Um, the question is very simple. Uh, who cares about Bujak? I mean, really. It's at the end of somewhere. We don't know where it is. Why should we care about Bujak? You know, like, who should care about Bujak? Bucharest should care about Bujak? I mean, not even Kishinev is really that interested in that region, right? Because it's so complicated and you have enough issues on your own. Kiev, well, yes, maybe just Odessa, but then the rest can just go because I'm, I'm trying to be extraordinarily um, um, Mr. pushy. Yeah, and that's my point. Do you think Mr. Putin cares more about this region than Bucharest, Chisinau, Kiev, or Washington? And if so, how should we go about that, and what should we do, and if we can do anything, actually? Thank you very much. Unfortunately, Unfortunately um, I do. Uh, I think uh, Vladimir Putin uh, uh, think more of this region than in Bucharest or than uh, in other part of uh, the world. That's the, the reason uh, that I made uh, the movie. Uh, to give some information here in Romania about uh, uh, this uh, region, and yes, the, the answer is uh, the replay is uh, in your question. Yes, who cares about Bujak? Yeah, uh, as for Moldova, of course, unfortunately. 
We don't care enough about uh, Gagauzia and Taraklia. We have big problems, not because of just of Mr. Putin, but because of our indifference to this. So we have our, as I said, inter problems of a relationship between the center and periphery, which should be solved uh, irrespectively of what Mr. Putin is saying about this. Unfortunately, we didn't do this, and this is uh, a problem which could be added to the whole picture geopolitical landscape. Of course, we care a bit about our friends, Moldovan's friends in, uh, in southeastern Ukraine, because we have uh, uh, property there. We have a tradition to go to resorts to, to, to that place for not very rich Moldovans. This was a very good place for having rest and fun. Uh, in Odessa, in uh, Kilia in uh, Vilkovo, but uh, now it's uh, over. It, it's not yet over, but it started to be less and less, and uh, we, we don't have a clear response. And maybe Hanna will tell about uh, Ukraine, what Kiev is. I'm not sure Putin cares that much. I mean, he might care tomorrow if, uh, God forbid, there is escalation and, and war comes further to the, to the West, but I haven't seen any indication, and it's high on the pecking order of, of the Kremlin. And mind you, he has lots of other issues to to take care of, not least Russia's regions uh, themselves. Uh, I mean, certainly, it's not very high on priorities in Sofia, unless there is the the next fight on what to do about Russia. Then suddenly, it comes on the radar, uh, Bujak. But it comes as Bessarabia, Arabia, so even. Its particularity is not very visible uh, uh, over there. But I, I don't think, again, Moscow has such a focus uh, these days on, on, on Bujak. I'm, I stand to be corrected, of course. Um, as everybody started from the second question, I will also do it. Uh, Ukraine cares and the Kremlin, unfortunately, also cares. Why? Because it's bordering Transnistria. And uh, as it is the necessity both to have the buffer zone, because it is still the Russian military there, so definitely we care and we monitor the situation all the time. Uh, from all points of view, from the pure military, strategic security issues, uh, to the uh, ethnic issues that can be there. The second, uh, uh, why Kremlin cares, uh, again, uh, there are quite a plans to have this line uh, from Donbass to Crimea and in ideal variant from Crimea to Transnistria. They were vocal for several times about this. It would be quite a difficult because Dnepropetrovsk is in the middle of this route and I can't imagine to take uh, Dnepropetrovsk so easily. But at the same time, from Crimea, you can go to Nikolaev and Kherson, which are not very much secured. And uh, it will not be the whole Odessa region, but definitely the south, uh, will be quite easily, and it is access to the Transnistria as well, which is not uh, now quite an isolated. Uh, and if you come in the summer, you will drink the wine, the herrings, some other food, and you will care also. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, for the second uh, question, you asked about if suddenly Moldova will tell that all of them are Romanians and so on and so on. Honestly, we will not care about it. It doesn't matter for us. It is the choice of people. Uh, for us, we saw it as a very clever idea when in the Constitution it was written that it is Moldovan language. We thought about it as very politically keen and wise decision. But that's all, because we, for us, Moldova was quite an important back to the 17th century. We perceived that Moldova had the right to be a state and everything. So for us, it's never a question. We will not be so quiet if Romania and Moldova decide to unite. Because this will be totally different questions as their ethnic issue. Because in this uh, case, a lot of people in Ukraine start to be worrying about Chernauzi, for example, or about parts of Odessa region. And it will be more about territorial claims fear than of the ethnicity. But uh, I, I, honestly, I can't imagine such situation to happen. Uh, at least with this generation, because for many people it's more important to be Moldovan and to separate them. And the second, if something like this exists, 
Putin definitely will care because it will be just a, um, a stroke to his mind uh, to imagine something like this. First of all, uh, I like uh, the movie of uh, Vidu Nahoy. And uh, during the movie, I think other uh, titles could be So Far Bujak or uh, The Naked King of the uh, Soviet Empire of, uh, or No Man's Land. I uh, congratulate uh, all the speakers and uh, the um, people who organized that, but let's be realistic. The war will be in the next month. The war will be also in uh, the spring. Uh, will will be a very uh, hot summer. Putin will don't stop. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, the border, the true border between Europe and uh, Union and uh, other world. And congratulations, Mr. Nahoy, because you put there the frontier. The, it's on uh, the river Prut. The river Prut, I inform you, um, Miss from Ukraine, the Prut is uh, our Milkov. It's a new Milkov between Romania and uh, Republic of Moldova. And let me tell you frankly, I wait for the moment when Romania and Republic of Moldova uh, will follow the model of the um, federal Germany and uh, democratic Germany. Because this is a model of the future. We must be together in Europe, we must be united, but it's uh, the right of the Romanian people for the Republic of Moldova to decide their future. And in, in this case, let me tell you frankly, Transnistria was never part of Romania and will be a problem between Moscow and Kiev. Thank you very much. First of all, I didn't tell that it is not the right. I said that Ukrainians have a right to be worried a bit about our Chernovtsi and uh, some parts of Odessa region. But what you do between Moldova and Romania, it's only your business. And that's why I said that we will not care in case Moldovans will tell next day that they're Romanians. It's only their business and their right to decide. Not Bucharest right, but people in Chisinau, uh, in other uh, cities. Uh, the second thing is, the geographical center of Europe is in the Western Ukraine. So let us be not in the frontier, but still be a part of Europe as well. It's also our choice to be uh, there. And all other things, how you unite, where you unite, it, it's your business why Ukraine should care. That's the same why we ask you uh, to uh, respect our territorial integrity and not tell that Russia can take part of our territory. So every people and every state have their right to decide where they are and what to do with this. On this note, before things get any hotter, uh, let me thank Ovidiu very much for producing the movie, for having the idea, and the last word is yours. And, uh, Thank you, and let me uh, thank you uh, for the Aspen Institute and GMF for uh, entire support in order to produce and to promote uh, this uh, movie. And let me to thank uh, to uh, my team, uh, Kodrus Manov, my cameraman, uh, a very good cameraman and a very, very good driver, uh, and uh, it was important, believe me. Uh, and um, uh, there uh, is uh, Bogdan Tudor, uh, the technical director. Thank you, Bogdan, uh, for all. Thank you. And let me thank the speakers who came here from not so far, but took a long time to get here. Uh, Dimitar, Hanna, and Cornell. I wish you all a lot of good luck, but especially you, Hanna. Fingers crossed. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>